Hey, hello, how are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. It's really unlike any other creative space as an Asian American artist to be making American theater in that way. The whole premise of art is about transformation, right? It's about change. It's about sort of bringing questions to things. Because I think this country has always been, you know, a very wonderful, thrilling place for some people, but it's also at the same time, been an awful place、um, for those who've been left out of that promise. But it's an incredible promise, you know, liberty and justice for all. You want to feel like the world is familiar but strange at the same time, and that's what great art should do. And I think this piece really aspires to that. For me, Shakespeare as a dramatist is someone who invites radical remaking of power. He gives language to, in some ways, you know, to women who were considered less than powerful, and gives them a go at power. And you know, sometimes they fail, but they get this moment on stage where they have claimed the power. Hey there, this is Fei Wu, and you're listening to the Face Royal the Podcast. I am a digital marketing consultant by day and a podcast warrior during nights and weekends. Face Royal is created for unsung heroes and self-made artists. Nearly 200 episodes later, you can now easily access all of our stories and interviews with these amazing people via six categories. Make sure to check them out at faceworld.com/podcast. Today's guest. Is Sophia Skiles? Sophia is a theater performer and theater educator. She's a new story for our Live Your Art category. She doesn't just live it; she teaches it as well. Sophia has performed in work directed by many, including Anne Bogard, Richard Foreman, Mary Zimmerman, with strong ties to Mayi Theater and the National Asian American Theater Company. With over 20 years of experience in acting and teaching, Sophia taught in public schools throughout New York City, as well as pre-college students at Northwestern. I met Sophia through a mutual friend named John Haggerty, who has appeared twice on Face Royal podcast already. Sophia and John both appeared in a groundbreaking production of Shakespeare performance called Henry the Sixth, made possible by the NACO, which stands for National Asian American Theater Company. Henry the Sixth has an all Asian cast. This was a first for Shakespeare, and we were more than intrigued. The show went on between August 11th and September 8th, after weeks of rehearsal among the cast members, three and a half hours each night, plus rehearsal days and weekends. You might wonder why these performers feel the desire or even the urge to do this, including Sophia, who is a mother to her two children. The commute to and from New York City would have been enough. It's beyond Shakespeare. It's a movement of which Sophia, along with many others, are part of. As Asian performing artists, they have to earn and fight to be on stage. Hollywood's hiring freeze. Female, Black, and Asian directors rarely worked in 2017 films. We aren't talking about discriminations necessarily. Asian actors are often an afterthought, with very few roles to consider. How do we change this? Or before we can address this issue, how can we even be first made aware of it? I recorded this conversation with Sophia in late August, right before my extended trip for the Face Royal docu series. At the time, I had many doubts, uncertainties, and didn't feel confident for what I was pursuing. Sophia was just the perfect mentor for me to chat with, and I remember one thing she said that really stuck with me, which is. Fei, what if you could define a new kind of beauty? 
hey, I want you to really hear us out. And this interview touched my heart, my soul, and I hope it does something beyond just listening to a podcast for you as well. But thank you so much for listening. Uh, Tell one more person, two more people about the show. And that's how we keep going. Without further ado, please welcome Sophia Skiles to the Face World Podcast. I am so intrigued by Mm. what you're doing. So, I mean, I feel like, Sophia, first of all, I must admit, I really didn't know much about Shakespeare. Oh, I mean, I knew... You're the perfect audience. You're the perfect audience. Why is that? (laughs) Um, I think that it is the responsibility of the show to assume nothing but a sense of openness, not necessarily a sense of expertise, although that's, you know, kind of exciting. And there are certainly rewards for people who have familiarity with Shakespeare. But uh, to be the piece that is the kind of first opportunity or the first encounter is such a gift, at least for the, the part on the part of the actors and, and the people who are putting on the production to teach in a kind of way, you know, that, um, which every show, I think every good show really does, at least in the first few moments, we're teaching the audience about the world they're going to be spending the rest of, you know, the evening in or the afternoon in. And if a show is clear in its storytelling, it really is a sense of invitation and that the process of the show unfolds in a kind of learning. So hopefully, and I've always been a big believer in terms of Shakespeare being something that should be accessible to the masses, that it isn't really actually working its magic if it's inaccessible. Yeah, I let's talk about the project. It's going on right now in New York City, and you've been part of this very special crew. And I know I said that in transition to this recording, but it is the very first O-Asian um, cast for Shakespeare, Henry the Sixth. Yes. And, you know, the play itself lives in three parts and each of those three parts are evening length pieces on their own. And in fact, I think there must be, you know, a regional production somewhere in the States where they're doing simply Henry the Sixth, part one. And that is a full experience unto itself. And um, what the director of this project has done, Stephen Brownfried, is he's adapted it so that it can be in two evening length pieces condensed. So it's parts one and part two. But each of those parts is three hours long. And it can be complete unto itself. But if you indulge in the durational magic of six hours, you know, it's, it's a real feast. Although it is a first all Asian cast, the company, National Asian American Theater Company, this is their bread and butter. That's how they operate. And they've been operating in this way for over 25 years, holding down the line in creating opportunities, not only for Asian American Pacific Islander actors on stage, but also in some ways as vitally the folks backstage, the gatekeepers in terms of the producers, um, creating opportunities for a person who is Asian American you know, handling money and developing, you know, decisions around programming, um, as well as directors and designers of color. And as an actor being in those spaces, it's really unlike any other creative space as an Asian American artist to be making American theater in, in that way. Well, yeah. I mean, how long have you been uh, an actress? Maybe give us a little background of your, your backstory. Good question. I mean, I think like a lot of young people in the States, I, you know, I did some in high school um, and it was a strong enough interest and it was kind of the thing that I did. And I was, I I felt good doing it and I seemed to be good at it, that it was something that I ended up pursuing in college. I sort of studied it um, in a professional, in a pre-professional way, but it wasn't a professional school but it had a pretty rigorous training program at Northwestern University outside of Chicago. But alongside of that was a discipline called performance studies, which um, really captivated me. It sort of um, crystallized questions I had about theater, but brought in my love of literature, non-dramatic literature, and also questions I had about 
culture and representation and critical analysis that theater as a kind of cultural field wasn't really, it, it didn't really have for me on its own. I needed this other field performance studies and it's actually college was where the, was the first place that I experienced the history plays. And after that, I spent a, a fair amount of time um, doing professional and experimental theater work in Chicago. And then I decided, oh, you know what I really do. I want, I want to be someone who has made a lifetime commitment to um, developing professional skills, vocal skills, all of it. And so I did end up going to graduate school for acting um, in the city, in New York City at Columbia. Wow. Uh, so you have, is it fair to say that since high school, college, this has always been the route that you've pursued? I know you're a teacher as well. Yes. Uh, and, you know, all of those kind of worlds overlap in this really beautiful way for me. I like to think that had I had a chemistry teacher or um, a literature teacher, of which I had many literature teachers who made me fall in love with the material, but I had a really special theater teacher in high school who felt, I felt like she saw me and she heard me, which is both the miracle of, you know, being a teacher and also the miracle of creating theater. You're really seeing people and you're really hearing people um, in their full humanity. Um, so those two things kind of overlap for me. You know, I was already so excited to interview you after watching the show in New York very recently. I must say that what really intrigued me was after reading an article, um, is it called howlround.com? Yes, howlround.org. Dot org. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I know that you've been very busy creating. So it's not that, you know, the way that you, I think the title is called Who's Afraid of Virginia versus Loving, Learning How to Talk About Casting. As I was reading that, I continued the comments section. Um, and I know that you're writing about a potentially kind of a sensitive topic you know, about casting. And now you're currently in an all Asian cast. And I thought the way that you so calmly responded to this person, if I have to make an assumption, this person is probably not of Asian descent and it's probably not a minority, even though it seems to be anonymous. And it's intriguing because when someone comments on identity or race from a very prestigious point of view or from a very privileged point of view. Yeah. And it's fascinating uh, to challenge that, not an assumption, but to challenge the fact that it is really tough being uh, an Asian person in the entertainment industry. And I could have probably said that about many other industries I've personally experienced. Yeah. What What's your take on that? So to break it down, like what intrigued you to write about this piece? And I know that probably may have come from a few years ago, but any recollection of yours? Yeah, it's, you know, so it's a piece uh, that sort of focuses on a specific American play, Edward Albee's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which is kind of this, you know, real core canonical um, American play. It's one of the great American plays. And um uh, and there have been a lot of casting controversies circulating, a lot of plays that sort of have a fixed idea in, in sort of the American consciousness or American imagination. Certain art pieces should look a certain way, right? And they should be populated by um, certain folks who look a certain way, even though the whole premise of art is about transformation, right? It's about change. It's about sort of bringing questions to things. So how do we thoughtfully, artfully enter into, you know, being specific and bringing the right amount of integrity to an author's or an artist's intention, in this case, a playwright um, who has since passed, so he's not alive to sort of render his own kind of, you know, thinking around how his play should be cast. Um, and how do we also make these art pieces relevant and alive? and timeless, right? So n these are huge questions. And, um, you know, and theater answers them in these really, um, at times, graceful ways and times, you know, really graceless ways. 
you know, they can, uh, they can, they can do one of two things and then everything in between, which is to fix, you know, an historical moment that is, uh, demonstrates, you know, a status quo, right? Or it can, you know, bring questions and really butt up against like, gosh, you know, we are at the very edge of what the art, the author intends, but is that okay? You know, and is that in the service of opening the play up to more people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and opening it up to these values that we, um, I think more popularly we use these days, which is equity, diversity, and inclusion. You know, it's when you, when you look elsewhere or when you accept what is the tradition or what's always been there, then maybe there's no question against it. But there's a simplistic view that I have that, for example, on YouTube, even just makeup tutorials, right? For the longest time, most of them were Caucasian, very right. young, flawless skin, certain skin tone. And this didn't happen so long ago because YouTube hasn't been around for the past 20, 30 years. It's only been, you know, the past 10 to 15. So I noticed I literally would try to apply the techniques and it just wouldn't work. And no. it's like, it just wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and the funny thing is I didn't come from a background where, you know, I grew up as a tomboy. I had to seek out these influencers and not until, and I had this moment, I remember, you know, even though that was many years ago, I had this moment of seeing Asian faces on YouTube and actually made me pause. I, I must admit, I was like a little bit shocked to the system. It wasn't like, oh, my sisters, where have you been all my life? It took some adjustments. It's almost, almost as if I didn't recognize her anymore. Why is she here? And then you start to consume and there's a lot of internal conflicts inside of me, as, as strange as it sounds. But then now I don't want to use the word obsessed, but I only exclusively go to these people. I don't see theater the same way necessarily, but I think it's so incredibly important to have Asian actors and actresses represented in all of American theater and theaters from around the world. I mean, you use the word, you know, tradition, you know, and those are the words that I actually feel, um, you know, need to be kind of unpacked a little bit. Just because it's something that has persisted doesn't mean that it's natural. In fact, it's deeply artificial. And when we can kind of put those pieces in context, um, we can then begin to dismantle those artifices and create new ones, you know, Um, because it is, it's just human nature. And that is really like, you know, the theatrical impulse to create story and to stage stories is such a human impulse and that we neglect to include faces that reflect who we are as part of those stories, it deprives us all, whether mm-hmm. it's Asian faces seeing Asian faces, but white faces seeing Asian faces, mm-hmm. right? You know, that although it is, you know, deeply moving for me to be surrounded by the diversity of Asian American faces um, and Asian faces, I also have to say it's it's a beautiful thing for non-Asian faces, non-Asian experiences to see that too. Hi there, you're listening to the Phase World podcast. This is your host, Fei Wu. Sophia Skiles is a New York-based actor and teacher. She has over 20 years of experience teaching acting in a wide range of environments. Recently, she appeared in a first all Asian cast Shakespeare show called Henry the Sixth in New York City. It, it felt definitely very new, and part of me uh, felt like, oh, should I feel intimidated because I really haven't read much Shakespeare? And um, like you said, I think to me, what came first was not the show, was not the word Shakespeare was all of you guys. And like you said, it didn't matter what type of event, it didn't matter which part of Asia that you were from. It didn't matter if there's a Caucasian or African-American actor or actress in there. It didn't matter. Uh, But to watch the people trying to do this for the first time, because I know I read briefly that this is Henry VI, but they're all the stories written for Henry V. Actually, 
very little has been exposed about the sun. And, you know, I thought to myself, wow, that's, that's really fascinating. And then also I must say that why the people matter is also because there was an um, actress, I know that she may be, um, you know, older among the, the rest of the cast. And part of my heart just went out for her thinking, you know, the physical labor of her having to stand there. And I heard her backstory that she was actually originally from Hong Kong instead of being born and raised in this country. And, you know, brings all the humanity and all the vulnerability like into the show itself. It, it goes much beyond the lines. That's how I felt. Yeah. I mean, you know, theater is one of those beautiful experiences where you get to, as a as a working environment, hopefully that you get to, to, you know, work with a diversity of ages and experiences. You're working with someone who's, you know, much younger than you are. And I and it's it's fun for me to mention that, you know, this the, the play involves a lot of stage combat. And um I can't say factually because I don't know exactly their ages, but I know they are two of the youngest members of the cast who are fight captains and they're leading all of us in creating and insisting on safety and artistry inside of the stage combat. And then you have someone like Wei Ching Ho, who I think is the actress that you mentioned, who has been there and done that. And she is still, you know, I mean, not only she's still, I mean, she's thriving and we get to sort of see a lot, see what it is to create a lifetime of work and to continue make a lifetime of work in the theater, which as an Asian American person is so powerful that not only, you know, should you be doing this, but you can be doing this and you can be doing it all your life. And the most powerful thing, I think when I talked to John Haggerty about the show is, you know, like almost drew tears to my eyes when he was saying to me about the theater, which I think he's, it's relatively new to him. I don't think they have partner or he has worked for, um, the company before, and he used the word, I think I have to do this. You no, know? and, and it just, it's that important. You know, there's a message behind it all. And when I describe the theater, Henry VI, to my friends, to people who found out why I was going to New York to watch you guys, um, a couple of them, in a very friendly way, not surprisingly, said, okay, if it's about diversity and, uh, but hey, it's an O Asian cast, so like, does it contradict it a little bit? And I said, no, it's not because I started researching and reading these articles about um, Asian Americans, either as producers, as actors. These articles simply aren't so many of them. Like even if you want, right, they, they don't, the content don't even exist uh, to begin with. Then I saw the headline that says, literally they did a research within Hollywood. They stopped hiring or they simply didn't hire any Asian producers slash actors for the past, I forgot it was two years or five years, but an extended period of time, they couldn't prove their single new face uh, within this group. Breaks my heart and frustrates me. And we're like, what is that? How do you, well, you know? It, it, it's, you know, it is, it is, I think, um, for those who, um, and it sounds like, you know, maybe that, maybe, you know, the folks who you were raising this with, are exactly the kind of people who need to see this show. <laughs> you know, just see it. I know that's what it sounds like. And I think if you take it in isolation, it sounds a little bit odd maybe to kind of um, isolate, you know, a group of people in this way. But if you look at it within the larger cultural context, it's not only, it's not only powerful, but it's absolutely necessary to compensate for the comparative invisibility of Asian Americans. So the idea of seeing a whole room of them, that the whole of this fictional world is populated by a diversity of Asian American and Asian people is exactly what you want your theater to be about, which is about shaking your world. You know, it, it, you, you want to feel like the world is familiar, but strange at the same time. Um, and that's what great art should do. And I think this piece really aspires to that. It takes these Western pieces and so-called classics and gives them, uh, you know, life in ways that we, it, it reconfigures them in ways that are new and astonishing, hopefully, to us. Yeah. It, it, you just brought this memory to me 
which I totally wasn't prepared for. Um, my mom worked at the Forbidden City in Beijing for 37 years uh, as a master artist. And I was so astonished watching the way that she worked, but she was just my mom. And I, all her friends are these super incredibly talented, you know, craftsmen. And, but I remember spending so much time inside the Forbidden City, as funny as it sounds. Um, I watched so many foreigners, so many of them when I was growing up. I don't know where they came from, and not just America, but the, a lot of, let's just say, blonde, blue-eyed people that I was watching for the first time. And I watched them so curiously walk through the Forbidden City. And there's so many gift shops that sold these extremely traditional empire and, you know, sort of empress, emperor, empress, clothing, um, you know, swords. And and it just, for a second, I thought it would be really funny for them to even consider putting on those clothes or find them attractive. And uh, I saw little, little kids, you know, foreign kids dressed up in them and how comfortable they are. And then they, there were uh, recent years, they actually put put up a more theatrical atmosphere where you can really see yourselves in it. And then somehow I just saw this kind of transformation the other way, like border crossing the other way. Yes. I mean, you know, I think, you know, we would really have to remake the world politically for there to be a true sense of cultural exchange. If we could all just, if all clothes and all customs were equal, right, then we can all have a true sense of exchange. But we know that isn't true. Right. We know that, you know, the world is drenched in colonial history, drenched in, you know, political inequality, you know, economic inequality, et cetera. Um, so what does that mean um, to take from here and to give from here? Is there an actual exchange happening? Um, you know, because it does involve give and take. And usually when we think about whether it's white supremacy, there's a lot of taking, but not a lot of giving. Right. And that's where we get into places of, you know, cultural appropriation. Right. The taking without the giving. For me, Shakespeare as a dramatist is someone who invites radical remaking of power. He gives language to, in some ways, you know, to women who are considered less than powerful and gives them a go at power. And, you know, sometimes they fail, but they get this moment on stage where they have claimed the power and that's deeply radical or he'll give, you know, Shakespeare's or dramatists will give, you know, incredible soliloquy in the Tempest, for example, to someone who's considered less than human, this Caliban figure. And there's something so radical and transgressive about that, that, you know, the door is open for people who are not considered the center of power to take it and try it on. And I think that can be very theatrically satisfying and thrilling. <laughs> so is is there, I, I realize that I, because I've seen the show, I just assume everybody knows what's involved. And then people, the moment they hear Shakespeare, they already start piecing together assumptions. Um, what would be like a summary or like a brief Ooh, That's discussion? a good one. Yeah, some folks, if they do know Richard III, you know, if they have some familiarity with that play, which, you know, is is sort of the play that, immediately comes after the trilogy that we, we that we produce in these two parts they can say oh this is where you know this is the origin of Richard III and at, out of a at sort of like out of a vacuum of power Richard III kind of takes it and runs with it in this murderous spree but if they don't know Richard III um, you know one way to describe it is that you know it's it's kind of what's happening in the world right now it's about politics it's about politics um, when uh, a leader is not considered strong and a nation is vulnerable to um, ambition. It's what happens when the center doesn't hold. And if you can describe it that way, people immediately like, oh, that's a play about today. <laughs> the center isn't holding the leadership and the sense of division, internal division which, you know, it often feels like this country, the United States, is sort of on the verge on. It's on the verge of peril in a lot of ways. The idea of who we are as Americans, as an example, almost every nation has this, like, what does it mean to be 
you know, in the, in the Shakespeare plays that we do, like, what does it mean to be English? Ah, oh, well, at least we're not the French, you know? Um, and what does it mean to be an American? Well, at least we're not, we're at least we're citizens because we're really in this moment, you know, almost defined by what we're not as, a, as opposed to what we are. Um, and that is painful. Um, it's painful because um, when, it, when you get down to it, it's really like we are human and those people are not. And that is a recipe for violence. And I feel like that's the tension that this world, Shakespeare's world, which was going through a lot of political upheaval, you know, what does it mean to be human? What makes a human? Is power compatible with humanity and civilization? I think it's so, I never, you know, I felt like now as you're mentioning it, it, it become a very clear why the show was created in such a critical time. And, and I think about the message, there's, there are the creators, the scripts, and the message that's being delivered, but it takes so many people's commitment to actually make it happen, to ship and to deliver this. I think about the show, ever since I first learned about it, there's, there's like this storm going on in my head thinking a lot of things, such as, you know, what can we do to put ourselves back in control again. And that's what the show is sort of asking me to think about something along that line. Like we know it's out of order. We know America is not what it once used to be. And it's really sad for anybody to travel outside of the US and see the, just watch the look on people's faces, like how sorry they feel for people who live here. And um, for me to travel to China and have literally have to sit down with people to say, what you see on TV is not what America is about. It's not the America that I grew up in since the age of 17 and, and maturing into adulthood. There is something about, um, you know, what do we want most as human beings or as Americans? Do we want order at the cost of our humanity in a sense, you know? You know, we want law and order, um, or do we want something a little less easy to control, which is, you know, these different people, and can we sort of accommodate humanity in different forms and, and faces? Who America was or is or will be, I mean, it's, I think it's, you can also say that, and this is perfect. This is exactly what Shakespeare does. It makes you talk about the political moment, right? Um, you know, there's always been the soil is founded in in sort of blood, yeah, and violence, and dispossession, and um, and genocide, but also hope and freedom and liberty. And, you know, at least it's tried to aspire to that. But can it confer? Um, those promises to everyone, or is it only just the people in power? Because I think this country has always been, you know, a very wonderful, thrilling place for some people. It's always been really terrific for some people, but it's also at the same time been an awful place, you know, um, for those who've been left out of that promise. But it's an incredible promise, you know, liberty and justice for all. And and I think sometimes rethink the inaction of, you know, we're responsible because we're so privileged. I, I live in Boston, um, New York City. It's just an incredibly vibrant place, liberal place. But there's so many people living in the dark. There are people who want to, you know, join, want to believe that we can all get along, but there are no resources and no people they can connect with and talk to. You know, I feel like not to call myself an ambassador, but because I didn't grow up here, I noticed I too was kind of isolated in an environment where I grew up among only Chinese people that I didn't go to an international school and things changed drastically. And you know, to be honest, it took me some time to really adapt and, and get used to it and to be exposed to so many different groups of people, ethnicity, ethnicities. And I would urge people to really sit with someone, go to a, if you're scared, go to an Indian restaurant or just a Chinese restaurant with your best friend uh, and then just try it more than once or even better you know, connect with someone who's outside of your ethnicity 
go to his or her home. It's such an incredible experience that I've had. And that those are the stories that I'm left with when I go back to China and, and when I you know, enter anywhere else in the world. You know, it's not the money, it's not the fame, what's on my resume, it's the people that I had the privilege to get to know that I really wouldn't otherwise if I wasn't living in America. It's food and stories and art. You know, those are the things that make us human. I mean, I love the idea in some ways that theater is a kind of metaphor or that food and and theater kind of have sort of, uh, sort of um, cooperating metaphors. They're both gift giving impulses and they're an event. You can't, you can't really take it outside of the moment that you're sharing with other people. You can't um, package it. Um, It's not film. It's not TV. You have to sort of be there and experience it. Um, and it's a shared sense of space. You're, you're building community because you've shared time and space because it's not a piece of commerce. It's a gift giving impulse, but there's something so worth it about it because that's how you come to know people eating at the same table with them, sharing their food, where it came from. And that's part of the joy of the magic. And then you sort of only have one go for the you know, sure, there are people who might watch the show more than once, but there's something crazy about... Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> hundreds of hours you rehearse. And that was it. That mo- Those three hours, six hours were the only time that you might interact with that, you know, small, intimate audience. And they will walk away with whatever they saw that day. I, th- I think it's so challenging. It's nutty. I would not even trust myself to remember scripts for five minutes. I mean, five minutes is actually a very long time for people it's who don't- condense. It's condensed. It's yeah. condensed human experience. Mm-hmm. And you know what's thrilling as an actor working on Shakespeare is um, it's the most brilliant people at their most brilliant moments in the most extreme you know, ends of their experience. So it's so not like life that it reminds you of life. You know, it's these you know, wonderful contradictions but when we think about, you know, how it applies to life outside of the theater, you know, if we were to talk, and I do, and I, I think that theater in this way connects to a sense of citizenship and community. I love thinking about theater as a rehearsal for real life. Hi there, you're listening to the Phase World podcast. This is your host, Fei Wu. Sophia Skiles is a New York-based actor and teacher. She has over 20 years of experience teaching acting in a wide range of environments. Recently, she appeared in a first all-Asian cast Shakespeare show called Henry VI in New York City. What we imagine as audience, and there's the reality of the fact that you're not best friends with everybody who happened to perform with you, right? You haven't you just met them in a way, whatever, however many months ago. And somebody might in the middle of the show, while you are saying your line perfectly, somebody might just say line. And then, you know, somebody has to be reminded and you have to give each other a, what do you call constructive criticism or proper feedback to say, could we do this? I can imagine that happening quite a bit. And it's not a small cast. I mean, there are a lot of people running around on the relative- 16 of us. 16. It's ginormous, you know, yeah. it, so the, there's the play, which is kind of fixed, right? And it lives in inside of a script. And then there are the people who are trying to recreate or rediscover the play every night or every matinee. And as much as you've prepared, new things happen. We're human, new things happen. Um, and, you know, you prepare, you work and you research and you rehearse and you, you know, hope and you trust that that work is there. But I, I have to confess that I kind of live for those unintentional moments where something just goes a little bit not according to plan, because then you can really step in and support your fellow actor or receive support from your fellow actor. And it's a living, breathing collaboration. And it, you know, one of the fundamental building blocks of theater is the relationship between actor and actor. I, you know, as as an actor, I find that like delicious, you know, being able to truly trust somebody else, especially when, you know, in our everyday lives, we're kind of trying to protect ourselves from everything and contain and create safety and, and, 
and stability and predictability um, that you are absolutely dependent on these other people to get the job done. And it's lovely. That's a philosophy. That's a, it's a very strong belief because most people live in the opposite universe or world, which is, that's why I think is the foundation of human sufferings. Um, um, being a producer is particularly challenging. And I, and I have tremendous amount of respect for people, producers working in theater and in documentary, you know, especially independent documentaries. I had no idea what it involved to make sure things go well. Um, one thing that kind of got me through the most difficult times in was precisely what you said about uh, being, if you see the world and see your day to day as in things are going to happen, if you believe that life is messy and those frustrations will instantly, you know, disintegrate. I mean, they can't yes. get you. It's, I mean, you know, you're not alone. That's the beauty of doing theater. You're not alone. And if something, you know, kind of goes awry, the 15, in this case, 15 other people, plus, you know, the incredible support of everybody behind the stage to get you through that moment and the possibility of something actually inspired because it couldn't be planned. It couldn't be controlled, which is not to say, you know, um, that you didn't bring your work ethic your discipline, your preparation, you know, to the moment. So you have all that. Then hopefully there's a little bit of freedom on top of that mountain that you've built where you can really play because you've earned it, you know? And it's, it's hopefully what, you know, what the process is there to support. And getting there can be very painful because, oh, you know, I know, I know I've n- I'm not, fully confident about the score, the transitions, not, not just the lines, but what, what's happening inside of the lines and what's happening to the other person. But once you get a handle on all those things, you know, then there's this promise of a kind of liberation because you know all that other stuff that really makes it worthwhile. How does this show compare to your other shows and experiences? Um, I like to think that, you know, my favorite show is the one I'm working on right now. So this is my favorite show right now. (laughs) Um, Life changes. I, you know, this is a moment in my life. I'm in my forties. I'm, I have two kids. I don't actually live in the city. Um, so I commute, um, from the Hudson Valley, which makes this fruit all the more sweeter that it's something that like, Oh, you know what? This might be too big of a project for me to take on, but then Getting there and just, you know, being hungry for it makes it feel very, very satisfying. It means a lot to see, you know, a community of Asian American Pacific Islander Mm -hmm. actors own being kings and queens. Mm -hmm. I cannot even tell you how thrilling that is to be Mm -hmm. surrounded by people wearing crowns, you know, and speaking this language and owning it. You know, I think about when I was going to school um, at Northwestern and I was maybe one of two, a couple hundred students. um, And I was, you know, one of the only, not only one of the only, you know, Asian Americans, but one of the students of color at Northwestern at the time. To see this demographic be normalized on stage, you know, night, every, every afternoon and every night that we get to do this is a gift I'm giving back to that young person that I once was. I love that. Isn't it great to pay forward that way? And you're an educator on top of that and to be able to articulate that there's one way to feel it. I'm a very feelings person, but I think with your critical thinking experience, your your background, your degree in it, even just to watch the way that you write, it, it drew a lot of excitement because you're able to say things. I honestly, I wasn't able to piece together an argument in such a way. I think you have a, a incredible approach of saying something that's not immediately positive or negative. I think mm-hmm. it's so easy to be an artist and my mom is one. I consider myself one. And it's so easy to be extreme and to say something, to swear to whatever that may be. But I love how you're actually listening when somebody's giving you 
a concern or disagreement, you're able to dissect that. And, and it takes a lot of emotional labor to do that in case it doesn't, it wasn't yeah, obvious. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you, but I love it. I love that verb you just used, breaking in. I love that. I love it. That's exactly what, you know, I love to, I, that's exactly the kind of space I like to occupy. You know, you know, there are, there's, you know, the center and the margins, right? And they're both spaces that, you know, both, you know, people who occupy those two spaces are kind of like constantly sort of battling out. And there's interesting assets to be in the, you know, on the margins. You get this really interesting point of view, right? That you can leverage to build bridges or to break in. And I'm super excited by that because I think there are, it kind of sucks to be on the margins, right? You know, you feel disenfranchised, et cetera, et cetera but there is something that you bring or that you receive by being on the margins um, when you kind of move in towards the center and certainly make space for others. Absolutely. You know, that's something I've, I've definitely evolved through the show. Um, there's so much of what we talk about that is so vulnerable, that is often either on the surface or deeply embedded, but people are not really willing to address it or to talk about it. You know, I think that Henry the Sixth is putting surfacing all of that all at once. Yes. That it's you can't ignore that. So it's promoting this conversation to be held. Right. Uh, right. It's about being vulnerable in front of each other, which is really hard. I mean, we kind of carve out our our lives avoiding that as much as possible. Um, you know, one of my professors at Columbia, who I really learned a great deal from, Anne Bogart, she talked a lot about the condition of the artist is someone who is comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, and, and anybody who doesn't, you know, want to do art, they create comfort around their lives, which is totally legitimate. But what makes, you know, making art perhaps a little bit special is that, you know, hopefully we're willing to be uncomfortable and wrong and, you know, and to fail. I absolutely, as you can imagine, I absolutely enjoy this. I, I think there's something in addition to what you're paying for to the next generation, to the students, the fact that you are a mother, which I, you know, didn't ask at the beginning with, I assume with young children. Yes. Um, and that you chose to do this. You know, this is so much harder than someone who's just barely taking care of himself or herself. Uh, no judgment to people without children who happen to be in Right, that. right, right, right. Although I couldn't really do that when I didn't have children. I could barely take care of myself. And who am I to have kids? I mean, it's so goofy. But, you know, you just level up, right? You just, the thing that you're doing is a thing that's going to be challenging. Yeah. And I, I think it's such an important message that I'm, interviewing the mothers, the parents on the show, you know, yes. it gives me such a thrill to hear, especially women to say, I didn't just choose between either my work or my children. I chose both. And my children are so much happier, scientifically proven that they know that I am happier. You know, as a mother, I have something that truly excites me and my kids are so supportive. I wish more women knew that or know that so that they would choose themselves instead of waiting. It's hard because I think society makes you choose, right? You have to be one or the other, or there's this feeling that, um, and it's never, it's never going to feel right. You know, everyone's, everyone's going to have an opinion and, you know, it's good to have those questions. I think, you know, I, I think about them a lot. I think about not so much money, but how I spend time. That's really our true social capital is how do we spend time with whom do we spend time? It is a privilege and an honor to spend time with those six, you know, those 15 other people on stage and, and everyone else who, who, who brings us into that space. I know that's time well spent. I know these two people, these two people who are growing into themselves. All the time I get to spend with them is, you know, so it's like a, it's, it's an embarrassment of riches and how do you find a balance so that, you know, it's hard. It's so hard, but I, you know, the thing is you never do it alone. Oh my goodness. I have so much support and I know that too is, is, is privilege. Yeah. I mean, I was, it, it's so wonderful. And thank you so much, Sophie. I will, I shall not take more of your time and oh, um, you're beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Please rest up and eat thank something. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and we'll stay in touch. 
Yes, for sure. Hi there, it's me again. I want to thank you very much for listening to this episode, and I hope you were able to learn a few things. If you enjoy what you heard, it will be hugely helpful if you could subscribe to the Face Royal podcast. It literally takes seconds. If you are on your mobile phone, just search for Face Royal podcast in the podcast app on iPhone or an Android app such as Podcast Addict, and click subscribe. All new episodes will be delivered to you automatically. Thanks so much for your support.